Welcome back to another episode of Introduction to Operating Systems and Virtualization. My name is Scott Neal, and today's second lecture, Understanding Virtualization, we're going to be defining virtualization itself. We're also going to be talking about some of the key players associated with how we see virtualization in today's environment. That would be people like Popek and Goldberg and their three properties of virtualizing an environment. We're going to look at Moore's Law as well. Uh, we're going to talk about trends that really have driven us to the point of needing virtualization in our IT environments. And we're going to talk about why virtualization is so important, particularly in today's data center environments before we cap off the lecture. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, if I have a computer like I have here where I'm recording my lecture today, and I decide perhaps I want to try out a new operating system, but I don't want to destroy the operating system that's currently functioning and working well. I have no guarantee the new operating system is going to work as well as the old one. Uh, or perhaps I want to install an experimental application or a series of applications that I want to see if they play well together. Uh, or I want to set up a PC for a specific purpose. Maybe I want to test some malware, but I don't want to jeopardize my physical environment. How can I do that? Well, quite simply, in today's world, that answer is virtualization. Uh, virtualization, the creating virtual instances of machines, uh, applications, and so on, uh, really gives us a lot of flexibility that otherwise we would not have. For instance, if I want to create a new operating system, I can do so, uh, and I don't even have to create separate disk partitions like I would in a dual boot environment on a physical system today. I can do things like suspend the system. If I want to go eat lunch and I'm in the middle of doing something complex on my virtual machine, I can just suspend it and then come back and restart it, and it will start right back where I left off and continue my work later. I can do snapshots of that system. So if I want to uh, do a before and after snapshot of something I'm testing, uh, and I want to have the ability to revert back to that original configuration so I can test it again or to make a comparison, or maybe I want to have snapshots so that in the event of corruption of the virtual machine itself or the machine gets hacked, I have the ability to revert back very quickly and seamlessly to a snapshot that I know is in good working order and bring my system up to production again very quickly. Snapshots and virtualization allows me to do that. I can even create a whole network virtually. Uh, I can create virtual switches and I can attach uh, uh, virtual machines, whether they're servers and workstations, to the virtual switches and create an internal switching environment that to the user is seamless. Um, so there is a lot of flexibility with virtualization that really uh, is appealing uh, in today's IT infrastructure. So we're going to talk a little bit about why that is today. Uh, as far as the vendors, the leading vendors associated with virtualization, VMware, was an early contender and it's still the predominant uh, vendor out there when it comes to virtualization. We're going to be looking at very heavily uh, VMware's workstation, workstation player. We may even touch a little bit on vSphere uh, during this course. Uh, we are going to also be looking at Microsoft's Hyper-V. Uh, Microsoft's been making some gains in the virtualization market with their Hyper-V utility that is found in Windows 8.1, Windows 10, Server 2012 R2, and Server 2016, uh, which comes natively uh, in those and it can be added as a feature. Uh, we're going to demonstrate some of that in this course as well. We're going to look at some other vendors that are not as big a players as those. We're going to look at Oracle's VirtualBox, which has some interesting features not available in the free version of VMware's workstation. And we're going to touch on or at least talk about some other vendors that are out there and how their products uh, compare to uh, uh, these other products that we're mentioning today. So uh, as we move on, what is virtualization? Well, it really is all about abstracting a resource. That is the process where we take a physical server or we take a physical instance of an application and we convert it into some sort of virtualized machine that to the users appears to behave as it did before. 
Um, it really is the new model for how we utilize resources in our IT environments today. It really does represent the next application platform infrastructure, and we'll talk about uh, some of the reasons why here in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I do want to go over a couple terms that you're going to be hearing throughout the course. We're going to be talking about virtualization or virtualized hardware. Uh, virtualized hardware really emulates a separate hardware environment in an existing operating system environment. So uh, I can virtualize nearly any type of physical instance out there, uh, whether it's hard drives, memory, NIC cards, even peripheral drive, drives, uh, devices, USB ports, things like that can all be virtualized in today, using today's virtualization technology. Uh, host computers, uh, all virtualized systems have to run on some sort of a system itself. That system is a physical computer and it will run the virtualization software layer for the virtual machines to run on. We refer to that system as the host system or host computer. The virtual machine itself, the operating system running in the virtual environment, is going to be the guest computer. So just some quick terminology, get it off the plate, and let's continue with the lecture. Um, virtual machines really consist of two different types of files. Those files are stored on a host computer environment, usually in a folder representing the virtual machine. So if I create a virtual machine, I want to make sure to move the entire folder that that virtual machine resides in because it's going to contain multiple files necessary to run that VM. Uh, one set of files is the virtual disk files. They're used by the virtualization software. They're going to emulate the virtual machine's hard drive. So when I build a virtual machine, uh, I can either attach or create a hard drive at that time. And that hard drive is going to be represented by one or more files, depending on what options you choose. Um, and I can attach multiple hard drives to a virtual machine, uh, depending on the product I use. That, that process can be extremely simplified. Um, but it really is just a set of files. And the set of files hold the data for that virtual machine. Virtual disk files can be dynamic or set up as static in nature. Uh, as far as size-wise on the machine, we'll talk about that later on. The other set of files that you are going to see in that folder are the configuration files. They are going to contain all the configuration settings for that virtual machine. Things like the name of the machine, the access rights associated with the machine, where uh, have, it will have a pointer to the actual virtual disk files that are going to be utilized by the machine. It's going to list or, or demonstrate the amount of memory to be used by the virtual machine. It's also the network settings. and there are just dozens and dozens of device and security settings that are represented in the configuration files. Configuration files can be edited. So we're going to edit or show you some examples of editing configuration files at some point in this course as well. Uh, so virtualization, the whole concept of virtualization is not new. Uh, mainframe virtualization actually was discussed and implemented in some fashion as far back as the 1960s. And uh, it really kind of led this whole, began this whole discussion about what is virtualization, how is, what are some of the goals of virtualization, and that can be codified in a paper in the 19, 1975, I believe it was, by Gerald Popick and Robert Goldberg, and that paper was called the, uh, uh, what was that, the Formal Requirements for Virtualizable Third Generation Architectures, that's a mouthful. Um, but in that paper, if I distill it down uh, to some takeaways for that paper, there are really three takeaways when it comes to uh, Popek and Goldberg's uh, paper. And those three properties that should be associated with virtualization include fidelity. That is the, uh, the fact that the virtual environment, when said and done, should be as close to identical to the physical environment it represents. So that's what we mean by fidelity. Uh, another property associated with good virtualization is isolation or security. So uh, the virtualization, uh, uh, the VM monitor, virtual machine monitor must have control of the system resources. The virtual machine monitor is what we call hypervisor today. Um, and it must maintain control of the system resources. Also, 
when it comes to performance in Popek and Goldbeck's world of virtualization, you should see as a user little or no difference in the performance of the physical uh, compliance when compared to the virtual compliance so, uh, appliance. So if I take the physical appliance and the virtual appliance and I look at them, then I should have no noticeable degradation in the virtual appliance when compared to the physical appliance. So those three properties, fidelity, isolation, or, security, or safety, and performance are the three big takeaway properties when it comes to virtualization, when it comes to Popek and Goldberg's paper. Um, so what is a virtual machine monitor? Well, we're going to talk about hypervisors or virtual machine monitors in the next lecture, but really the virtual machine monitor hypervisor is just an abstraction layer that sits on top of the host system responsible for driving virtual machines. It is the layer responsible for tricking the virtual machine into believing it's a physical machine and it's going to interface with the physical host system hardware. So you hear the term virtual machine monitor or hypervisor it's really going to be this abstraction layer, uh, this coding that drives this functionality. All right? Okay. So, another key player uh, that really uh, is a key component to why we virtualize today centers around the concept of Moore's Law. And Moore's Law really is something that was devised by a man named Gordon Moore back in really in the 1960s. Um, in 1960 Gordon Moore came out with this theory that uh, microprocessors really would in, double in processing power every you know every year every two years whatever it was. Um, anyways he revised that in the mid 70s to two years or 18 months and so the Moore's law really hypothesizes in today's world that processing power will double roughly every 18 months so uh, it really was centered around processing power this concept but we do apply Moore's law to many other technologies in addition to processing power um, and it's important to note that from 1980s, 1990s, all the way up to 2011, 2012, Moore's Law has held pretty constant. However, uh, Intel came out in 2013 and said that when it comes to Moore's Law, uh, they are skeptical that Moore's Law will hold true beyond the next decade or so, at least in certain circles. It's hypothesized that Moore's Law will only hold true for another decade or so because Intel has said that they're processing the what the rate in which they're developing new processing power has decreased. So uh, stay tuned. In the next 10 years or so, we may no longer be talking about Moore's Law. But for now, Moore's Law is a very viable concept. If you sit and look at, like this graph shows, uh, the uh, processing power associated with each generation of chip that comes out is pretty consistent with Moore's law. So uh, just to give you an example of what that means to us today. Uh, a processor in today's world with a 64-bit address bus has the ability to address well over 18 exabytes of memory. So, for those of you who don't remember their byte sizes, very important, think about byte sizes. A byte is really 8 bits. 8 bits, the whole concept of 8 is very important in these equations because a single bit, or 8 bits, represents a single character. So, that is represented in a byte, and that's why we talk about bytes, because when we break it down, we're really referring to characters. Um, when I was um, in the mid 90s, I remember purchasing a 50 megabyte hard drive. Uh, and I was the envy of all my friends because I had this great big, huge hard drive that I would never fill up. My gosh, Scott, what are you going to use a 50 megabyte hard drive? 
I still have that 50 megabyte hard drive somewhere and I keep it as a relic uh, because obviously in today's world uh, as I record today 1.5 2 terabyte 3 terabyte hard drives uh, we're seeing solid state drives quickly moving into the affordable terabyte range for the common user um, and when we talk about data in today's world uh, we're really talking about data in terms of exabytes and exabytes is 1024 petabytes worth of data so you think about just from the 1990s to today how exponentially um, the amount of data we process whether it's processing it over a concept of hardware whether it's processing data over storage capacity how much exponentially that is increased is phenomenal so that just is, is a mind-boggling fact that I thought I would share with you um, so let's move on all right so Windows in really kind of is a driving force in why we virtualize today if we sit back and look about why that is um, well companies began to identify technological achievements as a way of achieving some sort of competitive advantage over their competitors while saving money and this really began in the 1970s when companies really began to look at technology as a solution for saving money and getting a one-up over the competitors um, the only problem with that is in the 1970s there were a lot of proprietary solutions particularly when we talk about computing that uh, were out there they were not standardized uh, and, and for those of us that are in the IT world today we oftentimes associate proprietary solutions with very expensive and very inflexible um, solutions so that's very true uh, the more proprietary solution is we generally see that uh, solution being more expensive and more inflexible and in how we can use it um, so when Windows came along one of the nice things about Windows is that Windows really provided an operating system platform capable on running on multiple and in many cases superior hardware platforms. Now Windows wasn't the only operating system that did this. Unix actually kind of falls in this category too. It's capable of running on a wide variety of platforms but Windows really took a hold um, and it really was capable of running a wide variety of, of, of it really began to standardize the way we uh, envision computing to, to be uh, it had and so Windows really uh, by running Windows uh, in PC settings um, we really began to see costs drive depreciate uh, and this whole concept of defeating platform lock-in really started in the 1980s with Windows so uh, people began to identify Windows as a solution for getting out of being locked into specific vendor specific platforms being able to use a more generalized standardized computing environment um, however there are some drawbacks to that and one of those drawbacks was on the server side of Windows so uh, it didn't take long uh, for IT admins to realize that by running multiple applications in ser Windows Server environments often led to things like resource contention, uh, difficulty in troubleshooting, um, and so us IT admins began to develop this whole concept of well we have one server put one type of application on it and that's what we're going to run on it. Um, and at the time and even today that makes sense because uh, we know that if that service goes down it's going to affect one service we will still have the ability to run all the other services on the other servers and in addition to that it's going to simplify our troubleshooting uh, uh, because we're not having to um, figure out if one application is causing problems with something else and so on and so forth so in a lot of IT environments today you do see large data centers or large server rooms uh, where we have a lot of servers that are running one service one type of application whether it's a file server a database server 
uh, whether it's running the domain controller and nothing else. Um, so because of this, data centers have grown exponentially. Um, there's a problem with that too. Uh, not only are we dealing with the hardware issues associated with that, but now we have to cool these data centers. You know, uh, servers are, they produce a lot of heat. Uh, they eat up a lot of power. They take a lot of cabling. Uh, they eat up square footage. It takes people to run them. And then all that stuff has to be secured. Uh, so that all equates to one big word, and that's money. Uh, there's a lot of money associated with managing a data center or managing a large array of servers. Um, so uh, that's an issue. That's uh, an elephant in the room uh, anytime you go and talk about buying new servers and so on. So that's one issue that drive, drove us towards virtualization. Another issue that, that drove us towards virtualization is Moore's Law itself. Because if you look at Moore's Law, what Moore's Law says is that the server that I buy today, in 18 months, that server that I buy in 18 months is going to be twice as powerful as this server I bought today, roughly. And if I buy a server today and I put it on a five-year rotation because that's when the warranty period expires for the server, um, then the server I buy five years from now is going to be exponentially more powerful than the server I'm running today. Um, but when I go and I buy that server five years from now to replace this server, how much has my application use for that server increased? chances are it is not increased exponentially, which means that that new server, I'm going to be utilizing far less of its resources to run that same application as I am today in today's environment. I'm going to be paying probably roughly the same amount for that server, but and I'm getting more for my money, but I'm utilizing a lot less of its resources, and therefore I'm wasting a lot of money on that server. So that concept alone is one reason why virtualization has become very appealing to us IT admins because it allows us to recapture some of those resources. Um, so this whole concept that I'm beginning to, we've kind of talked about is represented as server sprawl. So when you hear people talk about server sprawl, they're really talking about this whole concept that we no longer uh, allow for multiple applications to run on a single server. Uh, we now uh, run very simplified uh, configurations on each server so that we can maintain them easier, that we can troubleshoot them easier, and that if something goes down, we don't bring down the whole network. Um, so we now run uh, a bunch of servers, multiple servers specialized for specific applications. And so we end up with a rack full of servers or a building full of servers and each one of these servers really is running one thing. So server sprawl just as much as IT has become a center point in how we do business the server concept of server sprawl has been increasing at an exponential rate as well. And because of that, we find that IT uh, departments are eating up more and more of the company's resources in order to maintain the environment that we want to maintain, you know, uh, to be competitive in today's market. So service brawl is bad because I have hardware costs. All of these servers cost money. Uh, the RAID systems, all the network cards, all this stuff is expensive to buy. Right, you're going to pay, you know, very least fifteen hundred dollars for a very simple server. Servers can run up, you know, five thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand dollars for a server. That server is going to be replaced at once every five years, perhaps. Um, servers take up space, so server rooms, really, particularly older server rooms, designed for a few systems. So space is always, uh, you know, we're always competing for space when it comes to server rooms. Even in data centers today, we're competing for space. Um, 
there's a lot of power associated with running a server room. You're cooling the server room, you have to power up the server room, all the switching for the server room, all the lighting, all the utilities for the server room, all eat up power, power costs money. And when we combine that with the whole concept of Moore's Law, where we're only running 15% uh, utilization from most uh, server class systems today, that equates to a lot of unused hardware capability in today's server infrastructure. So that is why virtualization is so appealing to us. So what does virtualization allow us to do? So one of the things that allows us to do is to consolidate. So the concept of consolidation revolves around being able to run multiple workloads now on a single host by virtualizing those workloads and storing them on perhaps a more powerful server. But in the end, if I had buy a more expensive server and I run 10 or 20 servers on it, I am saving money over time, not only in the cost of the hardware, but I'm also saving money because I don't have all the power considerations of those multiple servers. I don't have the maintenance considerations of those multiple servers and so on and so forth. Um, so the more I can improve my consolidation ratio, the more money I am going to save in the big picture. The other concept uh, that tends to accelerate virtualization is the concept of containment or being able to deploy new applications in a virtual infrastructure, but doing it with the existing resources that I currently have. So uh, you'll see that IT uh, environments that are not familiar with virtualization, when they get into virtualization, they start off with the containment concept. Well, gosh, we need uh, we need another server, we need another two or three servers, but but you know, I can't afford it. I can't afford to go buy all this hardware. How can we do that? Well, we can virtualize those servers. We can use them on an existing platform uh, and run it that way because we got this box over here that we're underutilizing. That's a concept of containment. Uh, as the IT department matures in virtualization, then they really start looking at this concept of consolidation or being able to go out and say, you know, why don't we virtualize more of these systems? And the next time we buy a piece of hardware, we're going to buy a single piece of hardware or mirror that hardware and run these applications on it, and then we can get rid of all these, all these other boxes. That's a concept of consolidation. Uh, it's important to note that as far as, I think it was 2011, a study came out that showed that virtual servers now outnumber physical servers in most IT environments or IT environments as a whole. So virtualization, it's not a matter of, of if you'll be dealing with virtualization. It's a matter of when and to what degree you're going to be virtualizing your environment. Uh, another concept or a trend that accelerates virtualization is cloud computing. Cloud computing is really driven by accelerations in virtualization technology. We're going to talk about cloud computing in more detail as we near the end of the course. Uh, when we start talking about uh, you, know, you know things as a service. Um, but uh, cloud computing is really all about virtualizing stuff and then providing those virtualized environments to uh, our users. Um, so but there are other things that we can virtualize. For instance, virtualizing servers, which we've talked a lot about today. Uh, you know, the best model for virtualizing a server infrastructure is to use a hypervisor that's capable of interacting directly with the server hardware to drive application-centric virtual machines. Um, we'll look at the different types of hypervisors in the next lecture. Um, there are different types of hypervisors. The one. Uh, so this particular hypervisor, without going into detail, is this model is the best model when virtualizing servers. Um, IT departments are utilizing containment consolidation strategies to maximize server efficiency. We are seeing these practices in real-time deployment. Uh, these strategies are being deployed in IT environments everywhere, all over the world. Um, so it's uh, you will be working with virtualized systems at some point. Um, virtualizing desktops, so uh, 
Uh, virtualizing desktops has some decisive advantages. Uh, one of the neat things about virtualizing desktops is I can, instead of having to go out and buy a bunch of full-fledged PCs, I can buy a bunch of cheaper, economic, thin clients. They're capable of accessing my virtual desktops that are hosted on some sort of server infrastructure. They're run more efficiently on those servers. They reduce the need for my help desk staff. Uh, and they also can, since most of these uh, servers or, or desktops are running in the same data center that my server infrastructure is I'm actually reducing some of the network traffic generated on the network as well so virtualizing desktops is a concept uh, that's been around a while um, there are like I said some advantages for instance um, that virtualized desktop can be accessed anywhere in the corporation by an individual user uh, that virtualized desktop can be uh, uh, snapshotted and brought back up in the event that there's an issue with it and so on and so forth. Another thing that we talk about or we'll look at is virtualizing applications. Uh, so we can, in, instead of virtualizing physical machines, we also have the ability to virtualize applications, the applications themselves. And that allows us to do things like reduce the licensing and deployment issues associated with application deployment, provides a more reliable application environment so that instead of having the contention of putting you know, applications on multiple types of PCs and having to manage those and make sure they work together, uh, if I put it in a controlled server environment, uh, I know that they're going to work better. Um, and uh, the concept of containers, which share an uh, operating system, uh, when people start talking about um, containers, like server containers, they're talking about being able to utilize a shared operating system where the virtual machine really is an abstraction of the physical hardware uh, in a container. Then the only thing that's really abstracted in a container is just the user space and not the physical machine. So um, we'll talk a little bit, hopefully, more about containers later on. Uh, in the series. But these are, are interesting ways, are interesting trends that are accelerating virtualization in today's world. Um, so why does virtualization matter? Well, hypervisors do allow multiple servers to run on a single host. I don't have to have as many servers. Uh, I don't have to have as much resources that are being consumed. They're going to be consumed more efficiently. And because of the way virtual machines are set up, they're set up and isolated. Even though they're on a on a same host, there each of those virtual machines is an isolated instance. They're treated as its own separate machine, and um, therefore uh, they really do provide a more reliable, more stable, uh, and more recoverable uh, environment for us to manage. Uh, virtualization provides a huge return on, re uh, on return on investment by removing the cost from the infrastructure. So the big savings when it comes to virtualization uh, is the infrastructure cost. So uh, by reducing the amount of hardware uh, that I'm having to manage, I'm reducing the number of people I need to manage it, I'm reducing the number of resources needed to manage it, and that over time equates to significant savings. Um, virtualization is not just for servers. Uh, I have the ability to virtualize desktops and applications re further um, or give me a much larger return on investment over time as well. And the first commercial uh, hypervisor, 32-bit hypervisor, was developed by VMware in 2001, just for a point of reference, and then others, of course, soon followed. So to recap today's lecture, Virtualization optimizes resource usage and can be used for a wide variety of operations. Primarily, one of the big functionalities of virtualization is to reduce server sprawl, but there are a lot of side benefits. It does improve efficiency. It does provide a more secure environment. Um, it does provide a more recoverable environment in the event of some sort of catastrophe or infection or something like that. Um, virtual machines run on host systems. So just get that straight that the virtual machine is the guest operating system. The physical machine it runs on is called the host. There are three properties for effective virtualization. 
So fidelity, isolation, performance. If you meet all three of those requirements, you are virtualizing effectively. And Moore's Law, still very uh, important in today's environment. We'll see how long it lasts. Processing power will double every 18 months, but it's going to apply. You're going to hear Moore's Law talked about in other technologies as well. Um, that's a, a commonality. Last but not least, data center virtualization drives down costs, costs in multiple arenas, arenas and drives better resource efficiencies and is the primary platform for what makes cloud work for cloud infrastructure today. All right, so that's all I have for you today. Um, next time we talk, we're going to be looking at hypervisors in a little more, bit more detail. They talk about the different types of hypervisors, how they're used, uh, talk about what platforms are you going to utilize in this particular hypervisor. I'm looking forward to it. I hope to see you next time.